The only ones who can explain the dastardly deeds that politicians do are right here. It's Joe Conley, SeattlePI.com, Mike Seeley of the Seattle Weekly tonight on Public Exposure. It's Sound Month and Review Time. Mike and Joel, welcome to the show. Hey. Good evening. Dastardly deeds politicians do. We've got to start with Perez Hilton. And the headline is, the Las Vegas woman is put on leave uh, from uh, work following the Wiener scandal. And, you know, I mean, I could, there's thousands of, of articles about, you know, the, the Wiener scandal. There's it, thousands of Wiener scandals in Las <laughs> Vegas. But go ahead. But I thought that this was the most appropriate one because here it is. The woman, Las Vegas blackjack dealer Lisa Weiss, has been placed on leave from the Bellagio um, for a week due to the media frenzy that ensued following her Facebook scandal with Representative Anthony Weiner. So here she is, the recipient, and Weiner still has his job. How come? Well, Weiner should still have his job, in my opinion, um, and so should this, this woman in Vegas. But um, it all depends on who your employer is, I guess, is the lesson here. But um, Weiner's mistake, and okay, sending out the pictures was a mistake, but yes. his big mistake was lying about it. Um, and I think that's, a, that's an age-old mistake that many politici politicians have made over the years. Whether or not it means you should quit office is a totally different consideration. Joel, is Mike right? Are the standards of... Uh, Decency is not the right word. Are the standards of use of judgment so low in Congress that we could enable him to continue on? Well, there's been a race for the bottom between Weiner and the uh, and the tabloid media over this, and the right wing media, mm -hmm. uh, exemplified by the New York Post reporter misrepresenting himself to the young woman who was on the receiving end out here. Mm -hmm. So essentially, what we've seen what we've seen is the tawdryness of everything. All sorts of reports on the potential consequences of a default, uh, new evidence of global warming and its acceleration, and so on has come up. Nobody pays attention because uh, because of Ant the Anthony Weiner scandal. Well, yeah, and and this is this is to me, it's you know I, I got to disagree with you, Mike. I think this is a no-brainer. This guy has so many personal problems that I don't think there's any way that he could be trusted to exercise judgment on behalf of the public because his vote counts just as much in Congress as my uh, congressman's does. Yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with you. I think the fact that he um, he's a pretty colorful character to begin with. Um, he's a congressional character. He's a New Yorker. I think these things kind of stack up in his favor, although I'll grant you, I mean, the guy screwed up six ways till Sunday, mm -hmm. but I still don't feel it rises to the level that he should be asked to resign or feel compelled to resign. And how much longer will he be in Congress? I think he may very well have his district eliminated. Uh, New York loses two congressional seats. The general rule is one upstate Republican district goes, one uh, New York area Democratic district goes. And I think a fair number of people would like to see Anthony Weiner go. Okay, well, let's go to something local, and it's our favorite topic. It's the viaduct of Joel Conley. Viaduct debate has lasted longer than both world wars. <laughs> <laughs> the, that is amazing, and I kind of wonder why. From uh, June 7th, Mike McGinn made anti-tunnel rhetoric the centerpiece of his 2009 mayoral campaign, only to deliver an artful qualification late in the campaign he would not stand in the way of the public will. Next quote. Since taking office, however, his honor has used every conceivable tactic to delay and obstruct the deep bore tunnel, deploying his political organization to put the issue onto the ballot. Why can't we finish this issue? We may very well, we may very well finish it, but it is essentially the strategy of create chaos, then conquer. And essentially attempting to throw, you know, it's throwing spaghetti against the wall, hoping you get something that sticks. And uh, he's, he's also been an obstructionist on the 520, but he was able to be effectively rolled on that. But again, it's, uh, it's an attempt to try, uh, try absolutely everything that you can to, uh, by, way of, by way of obstructionism rather than effectively governing and rather than, I think what, what the shift should be is to, is what I'm looking for, to uh, tight oversight of the project to see that the costs don't get away. You know, major construction contractors are at your feet or at your throat. There is no middle ground. Mike, are the weekly readers tired of this issue too? Um, no, because it's pretty entertaining. But I, <laughs> I, I think they may be tired of uh, the mayor's stance on it. Um, personally, I'm not especially surprised by the stance he's taken. I mean, he was basically a one-issue candidate and mm -hmm. sailed to victory based on that issue. Um, I think McGinn would argue that he's not going against the public will simply because the public will hasn't really been expressed on this topic. It's just way too scattered. People don't really know what they want. Um, what he is going against is 
a pretty ironclad agreement, um, a project that's going forward as we'll get into later in the show. Um, and the, the ballot referendum that's going to come up um, will pretty much accomplish nothing in terms of what's going to go down. I mean, it will empower the city council to do something. That city council is pro-tunnel. And they've already done what they're going to yeah, do. Yeah, so forget about it. I mean, it's pretty much a worthless referendum. Mm -hmm. More worthless than a non-binding rep referendum that put three different choices on the ballot a few years back. Oh, boy. Well, that's what I want to go vote on. Um, actually, what I really would love to see is the hot tub hobo machine. Yeah. Out of the Seattle Weekly, this and this relates to the viaduct right here, the hot tub hobo machine, because the new look for the downtown's waterfront includes one really bad idea. What is that idea? Um, thermal pools, uh, which are basically public hot tubs on the waterfront. And, you know, I love the idea of a good hot tub party for the public, but you have to consider the population down there. And I'm not trying to be anti-homeless when I say this, but if you're really going to create public works and you're going to have thermal pools on the water... Um, you're going to have a fair amount of the homeless population down in Pioneer Square uh, partying in those pools, well, or at from, least sitting in them. From the, uh, the article, we put the question on how to prevent uh, the thermal pools from becoming a homeless hot tub party, point blank to Steve Pierce, the city's waterfront project manager. He chuckled at the notion before conceding that he didn't yet know how to contend with it. You know, I, I guess my, my point being is that is the city's niceness just going too far? Um, I don't know if it's that. I, in fact, part of me feels like it's the opposite. When I was talking to, to Mr. Pierce, um, he mentioned that, you know, in soliciting public feedback, the number one thing that people said about the downtown Seattle waterfront was how they did not want there to be tourist magnets like there are now. Um, basically just saying that this city has a very hostile attitude towards out-of-town tourists, um, which I found pretty fascinating. Um, Downtown smells like pee. Well, I think we don't particularly like to be watched here. Um, and the, uh, the tourists, I think there's a wide perception that they get in the way, um, that, uh, that you have to give over the waterfront to them for a good part of the year. Um, just, uh, just a general, uh, general grumpy, uh, grumpy prejudice, even though uh, they are a major source of income to the city. Yeah. And even though uh, we fought for years to uh, make this a uh, takeoff point for, cruise, uh, for cruises uh, headed, to, uh, headed to Alaska, even those of right-wing groups that uh, strongly suspect the city and believe that we are the uh, linchpin of the left coast. <laughs> you know, part of the reason why I wrote that, and I didn't write it explicitly, was, you know, here we are with these crazy kind of Jetsons, Space Age, you know, boom time uh, sketches of like a future for the Seattle waterfront mm -hmm. in a city that already has many great neighborhoods and maybe isn't doing right by the homeless or other people it should be serving at this time. It just strikes me as a really weird kind of dichotomy there. Yeah, and um, actually I think that, that the, the column that you wrote um, kind of it brings a reality to what this entire project, the viaduct, the seawall, and everything else that is or is not involved and at some point in time may get uh, resolved, but it kind of brings a reality to it, mm -hmm. and, and that's pretty important. I, lots of times I believe that I live in a city that reality uh, and city government don't always work together. Well, speaking of city government, uh, Mike McGinn is now polling worse than George Bush, Richard Nixon, and Jimmy Carter. Isn't that interesting? Uh, the lowest uh, polls that uh, Bush and Carter got bef before, and well, and of course, Nixon, even right before the time that he was being ready to be ousted, was at 24%. However, McGinn is now at 23% approval rating. Do you believe that's accurate? I do, and I, I, I also sort of believe that, um, I'm not convinced Mike McGinn took office ever wanting to serve for more than one term. I mean, on a certain level, I kind of admire that. I mean, I, I certainly don't agree with everything he's done in office, but um, he has acted as though um, he's got political capital to torch and doesn't really care <laughs> about uh, winning again. Well, actually, that feeds right into your column, Joel, and it, uh, the, the recall McGinn, the nuclear option is a bad idea, and you say this in the column. It says, McGinn has justifiably angered lots of people. He governs to a narrow constituency of supporters. He advocates uh, ceaseless dialogue but refuses to listen or take the outreached hands of those he perceives as the establishment. Collaboration is a dirty word on the seventh floor of City Hall. Does McGinn deserve to be recalled, though? No. I think you do far more damage to the social fabric of a city uh, through a recall election. 
and through simply creating even more turbulence than, uh, than is achieved even if you manage to throw the guy out. It is, and I would agree with Mike on this, very unlikely that he will get a second term. The Evans-McDonough figures this week were 28% would vote to re re-elect the mayor, 61% vote for somebody else, 11% undecided. When your re-elects are at 28%, that indicates that you are, you are a, a one-termer. So the voters can uh, the voters can strengthen the city council as a as a counter counter source to his power, and do various things. But I think a re recall, it simply uh, would simply tear things apart, would force people into his camp. I remember when we did it with Wes Allman many many years ago. The mayor didn't really change. He survived the recall after driving around in a Plymouth sedan to make his case. The mayor's town car reappeared on election night. <laughs> Is, uh, you mentioned city council. Is city council getting a pass in all of this? Uh, we're likely to have a couple of, uh, couple of interesting races. I think Maurice Clausen's challenge to Gene Godden certainly is one to watch. I think uh, Bruce Harrell, who has only gradually uh, gotten into the job, will be seriously, uh, seriously challenged. Uh, so figure of the five positions are up that there will be um, probably two very serious races. Are the weekly readers angry at city government, or do they? What are they going to do? Um, I, I sense a tone among our um, readership and the city in general of, of, I don't know. I think they chalk it up to just kind of the times. I mean, you look at state government struggling like it is. Um, you look at McGinn making a lot of noise at city government. You look at government of all levels, and you're seeing um, some very, very painful cuts. Something else that we'll probably talk about later. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, you can criticize McGinn supremely from a political standpoint. Again, I'm not surprised by uh, kind of how he's been since he took office. But, um, you know, I think people just accept that this is a sign of the times, that government has to change how it does business, and it's going to be extremely painful no matter who's in charge. Speaking of extremely painful, well, first we have to go to a break, I see. And that's not painful because we are very fortunate to have Joel Conley, SeattlePI.com, and Mike Seeley of the Seattle Weekly with us. Uh, go to the newsstand, be sure to pick up the weekly, go to the website, seattlepi.com, and read Joel very, very often, and you're going to learn an awful lot. Okay, a mile of the Seattle Viaduct is going to come down early. The Washington uh, Transportation Department says it will mean a net savings of the, to the taxpayers of $900,000. Now, mind you, this is $900,000 on a $3.1 billion deal, and Governor Gregoire uh, calls a press conference and is lauding this, and this is a taxpayer savings of such an infinitesimal small amount that, you know, is she just reaching for anything she possibly can, Joel? I think there is, while well, I, I criticize her on many fronts, I think there's a legitimate attempt to bird dog the costs on this, that we do not have another big dig. So any saving, um, you, you, you tout it to the skies and you hope that there are more and you hope that there's a spirit in this. So I take a fairly optimistic view on what she's doing, even though, again, this is an infinitesimal percentage of the total cost of the project. But if you do have these things adding up and adding up and adding up, you not only create overruns, but you also uh, create an attitude that spawns more of them. Hmm. Mike, let's stay with Governor Gregoire, but mm -hmm. let's go to something different. Uh, out of the Seattle Weekly, Governor Gregoire signs a bill to increase college tuition by double digits and calls it the Higher Education Opportunity Act. I saw that, and I did a double take. And in the column it says, for example, students will now have the opportunity to pay 16% more for tuition than they used to. What is this? A, a, a hor horribly named act is what it is. It's pretty much as simple as that. Um, yeah. Would you then, if you're signing it, not tout it? I mean, to me, I feel like I'm, somebody's trying to spin me. And this one, you can't spin me on this. I mean, I, I you know, as with the viaduct savings, um, with the viaduct savings, I think maybe a press conference is overkill. But I think, like Joel said, any dime you save on that project, especially with the PR battle mm -hmm. um, that's being waged right now, um, it's worth at least you know sending out a press release. This one, I think, uh, people in Olympia are so clouded by the fact that things could have been a whole lot worse that even the bad things you celebrate, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, all right, we had to fight one battle instead of a world war. Um, it's just such a skewed uh, political perspective that's you know permeating the state, the city, mm -hmm. even the country that, yeah, it's kind of weird, but I almost understand it. 
Joel, I would ask the question, who would want to run for anything? But we've got some answers. Um, in uh, Joel Conley's column, welcome to the governor race, uh, McKenna. And you say this ab uh, about it. Um, you, you talk about the Democrats' attack. One is the sins of other Republicans. So are the Democrats going to... They'll, tr they'll try to indicate that he's uh, Scott Walker of the state, despite a very conciliatory style. Again, it's a situation, throw spaghetti at the wall. So they'll claim that he's an enemy of women's rights. They'll uh, try to associate him with Governor Walker. And they'll make a great deal out of his joining in the um, lawsuit against the mandate provisions of the uh, Affordable Health Care Act. Yeah, the, uh, you, you talked about women, and so it was beware the women of Washington. And then the, I think the last one was the harasser of health care. Didn't, didn't they win that lawsuit? Uh, Judges have ruled in both uh, both for and against the mandate provisions. Oh, great. <laughs> I think you've got three on one side and two on the other so, uh, so, so far. But um, McKenna has, I guess, done his bow to the right by doing this. He's maintained a very active consumer protection division, which has gotten him the votes of many uh, Democratic women, particularly in King County. He is much more formidable than anybody they've had. And... Um, I think he can take advantage of something else with uh, apologies to Marilyn Monroe, the 27-year itch. Namely, it's been 27 years since we had a Republican governor in office in the state of Washington. Wow. Uh, does uh, Greg <coughs> run for re-election? Probably not. And is, were the Democrats happy about that? Do they want somebody else, too? Um, yeah, I think they probably do. She's not running again, and I, I think none of it matters. I'm going to the Belmont Stakes this weekend. Mm -hmm. If I could bet on Rob McKenna against any horse in that race, <laughs> I would. Let's put it that way. True. All right. Well, let's change gears. <coughs> let's. We're going to stay with kind of budget, but it's 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 different. It's really really close to home. Seattle Central Community College weighs axing its American Sign Language Interpreter Training Program, and let's go to the quotes. This is from the Weekly. The college has said that the program has a number of weaknesses, including less than 50% job placement among its graduates, according to a report. Let's go to the next quote. Uh, That's not true, says Brenda Aaron, who is, who is a, and actually involved in the program. She and others have been frantically surveying recent graduates in response to the criticism. Most say it's easy to find work. This, there is a need out there for uh, this type of skill, right? This is the only program of its kind in western Washington. I mean, begin with that. Forget about what job placement results from it. This is a necessary life skill to serve a large, a significant portion of the population. I mean, uh, oftentimes when you look at budget cuts, um, stuff just isn't all that tangible. Mm -hmm. This is extraordinarily tangible, and hopefully, you know, cooler heads will, will prevail here. Why would this have gotten cut? Just because it was there? Well, it's not cut yet. I mean, it's certainly on the chopping block, and they're weighing what programs to cut, but... Um, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the rush here in judging the quality of programs is, you know, how effective is it from an economic standpoint. But certain things transcend that. Um, sign language, in my opinion, is absolutely one of those things. A decade ago, I was an assistant basketball coach at Ingram High School. The vice principal was Martin Flo. He was actually the person who all the coaches went to for advice, for guidance, for relationships with the kids whenever we had a problem. Uh, with uh, a kid and we didn't know how to handle it, we went to him and he took care of it. He was great. He ultimately became the principal. Ingram High uh, affair shows that the district is measuring wrong things. Tell us about, I think Mike this was in the weekly, so we'll mm -hmm. start with you. Tell us about what happened. Um, what happened to me, and I, you know, in reading the Seattle Times coverage, I really didn't get this impression. Um, in reading our coverage, I did. Just a colossal error in judgment by the acting superintendent um, to fire this guy in the first place. Um, she's getting credit for reversing her decision, um, whereas my take on it um, is you just don't fire someone and say, oh, whoops, here's your job back. <laughs> it's just an awful failure of leadership. If she has any aspiration to be the permanent superintendent, it should be quashed right now. Yeah. Joel, you have closely followed Seattle Public Schools for years. Mm. Ha it's it's not in a real good state right now, is it? No, no, it's no, it's not. There's been a crisis of leadership. I think all the way back to, you know, the death of John Stanford, um, 
There are, you have the underperforming South End schools. You have the request that we put $231 million into the families and education levy this fall to in order to rectify the situation, but again, not too much connection between how the money will be spent and what the results are going to be. Um, and in addition, in addition to this, you've had, you know, uh, board members, school board members tossed out, you know, new people brought in, uh, the new people then tossed out again. It has been a very fluid, very chaotic situation. While again, the uh, the East Side schools, the Bellevue School District, continues to place two or three high schools in U.S. News's uh, list of uh, list of top uh, top hundred, uh, we may not be as as horrendous as certain other school districts in the in the country, but there is a, a feeling that things have gotten out of control. What's it going to take to get control back, and who should have control? Well. Uh, that uh, is an open question. Do you do you bring do you bring in a hard nosed uh, business leader? Um, do you know to supposedly you know supposedly uh, begin to uh, begin to give orders? Um, can you give orders in a situation like the schools? Uh, do you bring in a military officer? Do you uh, do what uh, Los Angeles once did? Bring in a former governor? Um, it, um, we obviously have some schools where par parents are deeply involved in the education of their kids. Other schools where the parents have to work two or three jobs because they're you know newcomers to this country and where you have uh, you know a dozen different languages being uh, being spoken. Yeah. Well, let's stick with the schools. Um, the issue it's out of the weekly. The Seattle Public Schools faces a, Se a state investigation into the sale of uh, MLK Elementary to a well-connected church. Uh, here reports the Times in early 2007, months after the school was shut, Stevens, this is the former uh, Seattle Public Schools employee who went to work for um, former Governor Gary Locke's department, uh, called a meeting with two employees telling them uh, we have to get that property into the hands of the church. So I'm going to bow out of this because I mm -hmm. have a connection with a private school that's involved here. So is this an issue or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I can understand the district's impetus for considering more than just the highest bid. Um, I understand that. They were considering who can deliver the most community value. And, you know, what I think it was First AME Church, right? Mm -hmm. um, which ultimately uh, won the rights to the property that Bush, their bid for exceeded um, First AME's, but that's to be expected in some respect. Um, First AME promised several components that would give value back to the community and has delivered on maybe one of them. Um, one of several, and it, it ties back to um, one of the more corrupt uh, figures in uh, the Goodloe Johnson um, scandal that uh, got her booted from. Oh, Silas Par Potter? Yeah, Silas Potter, which, which extends to Goodloe Johnson, really. But, um, and it's part and parcel of that, but really what saddens me most about it and what doesn't make it a past tense issue is that, you know, the whole uh, Potter scandal has really tarnished kind of the African-American power base in the Central District of this city, and it's something they have to think hard about and we have to think hard about to repair. Joel, is, is this a repairable repairable issue? Uh, I mean, what Mike talked the, about. The Urban League's in cahoots right now for the, for the same reason. It's, it's repairable only if you see a new generation of people uh, people arise in the minority community as, as leaders. Essentially, you um, had various hacks on the take who have been hacks on the take for 25, 30 years around here uh, that we saw we saw in this program. And uh, I think there is a need for uh, people to uh, people to say to those who have been uh, been there forever, move on over, or we're going to move on over you. Hmm. I want to go in a completely different direction now. Joel, it's a column that you wrote uh, recently. It has the twilight come for America's wolves. Uh, it was June the 5th. Let's go to the first quote. Uh, Canis lupus is a key critter in the food chain, feasting on the old, the sick, and the weak in elk and deer herds. Next quote. Yellowstone's uncontrolled elk and deer had gnawed through plants and trees. Overpopulation resulted in starvation. Absent for 75 years, wolves have checked the population of hooved, uh, hooved animals. Will the public care about enough about this in these difficult economic times? First of all, the public overall supports the reintroduction of wolves. Secondly, however, you have somewhat fanatical opposition in the ranching community. We had a pack called the Lookout Pack, which got up to about 10 animals deep up the Metal Valley, of Wolf Creek, mm -hmm. in fact, in the Copper and Twist Pass areas. The wolves are a wonderful choice of summer habitat. 
But now that's down to about two or three uh, animals because, frankly, um, they were poached. We saw Tuesday of this week a U.S. Uh, a federal grand jury in Spokane indict some uh, people from the Twisp area for um, one of them for killing two wolves, attempting to uh, ship them to someplace in Alberta in a uh, bloody Federal Express pack, uh, boasting of killing other wolves. The alpha female in the pack uh, has not been seen since last May and uh, May of last year and is presumed to have been poached. So essentially you have, you have the situation of certain people thinking that they're upholding rural life. I tend to think that they're alleged human beings and demented, um, opposing, opposing something. And, and you know, the wolf uh, you know, has been eliminated from about 98, 99% of its habitat in the lower 48. Why not let them live in the remaining 2%? Mike, your publication is primarily probably read inside the city or, or in a, a very heavily mm -hmm. urban area. But and Polsbo, and Polsbo. Yeah, but they they do seem to care about issues like this. Yeah, that's right. Uh, why do you think that is? Um, well, I mean, I'd like to think our readership is a little more sophisticated. I, mean, I think newspaper readership in general is. Um, I think you know our readership is fiercely northwestern, and um, Joel's smartly touched on a, a pretty valuable issue that is getting overlooked by many others. And we have less than a minute left, but I do want to go quickly to a quote from uh, Joel, your column. Bill Gates says, invest in energy and save the planet. It's this quote. Most of our energy dollars go to utilities, which are monopolies, uh, which uh, goes to existing technologies. The energy industry spends less than the dog food industry on research and development. Where are we going to develop new energy from in 30 seconds? Um, we, either, we either find the means to do it ourselves or we allow the, uh, the Chinese to take technologies originally developed here, develop them further, market them to the world, and get a great leg up on the 21st century economy. Hmm. Mike, who wins the horse race? Nero, the runner-up in the Derby. Okay. Yeah. There we are. You've heard it all. We'll see you right here next week on Public Exposure. Take care.